All right, so I guess we can get started with the uh, second lecture of the morning. So my name is uh, Rolf Sager. I am a project scientist at the Beckman Laser Institute. I've been there for some years. I don't know exactly how many, but uh, but yeah. So what uh, Boston had alluded to earlier is you know I'm going to be talking about um, start going into the kind of inverse solver realm. You know the far more interesting experimental practical aspect as opposed to the forward model where you can actually now try to infer from actual materials what are the optical properties as opposed to the forward model where you would start with a set of optical properties and see what would happen to the light. Um, and the particular example that this lecture will be focusing on is this inverse adding doubling method. Um, interesting for the fact that, again, as Vasan had said, this is one of the first inverse solvers for uh, bio, bi biomedical uh, optics types of uh, problems. It's one of the simplest ones, and it's actually a direct solution of the radiative transport. So in this case, you're not going through and doing any kind of diffusion approximation, P1 approximation, or Monte Carlo type of simulations. This is actually a direct solution. But again, the important thing that I want to stress with this is the fact that this is under very particular um, constraints and conditions. And so that's always the one thing you'll always have to leverage back and forth, looking at a lot of different ways of how do you model tissue? How do you develop an inverse solution? It's you know what are the strengths and what are you giving up to try to enact this type of method? So for this lecture, again, there are three main teaching objectives that I want to try to get across. First is just to give you a kind of conceptual level, basic understanding of what is this adding doubling method, um, the fact that it's an exact solution of radiative transport, but under extremely simplified conditions. And the main objective of this is this type of method has been developed to really describe slabs of tissue with infinite lateral extent, but finite um, thickness. So from there, we want to try to go into how we can use these solutions of this forward model, of this adding doubling approach in an inverse solver case. And so this is what's referred to as inverse adding doubling. And the fact that you know the way this will go is that you have to um, measure the total reflectance and transmittance of a sample. And these are, the reflectance and transmittance is the output of the forward model. So adding doubling will give you, based on an absorption and scattering of a slab of a certain thickness, this is how much light that will go through the sample. This will hum is how much light that will be reflected back. Now for inverse is, well, you can measure those two things. What does that infer about what optical properties must have been in that tissue? And Finally, the, the last thing I want to go into detail is from a more practical standpoint, from an experimental, physical measurement standpoint, you know, what does it actually take to use adding, adding doubling as an inverse solver? And again, how would you actually go about measuring reflectance and transmittance in the experimental setting and stuff like that? So again, for the outline of this, I want to start off with, again, a general introduction of inverse solvers methods going into what is the forward model, what is this adding doubling, and kind of relay what the principles of operation of this approach is. So this will overlap with some of the ideas that were brought up in previous lectures, but just to try to get a basic background on this. And then going into the inverse model, how you, know, you have solutions from idealized measurements, and then start to let reality set in and say, well, what about actual physical measurements. What do we need to think about in terms of instrumentation, calibration of your system, and also how are these samples prepared and how, what impact that might have as to how well you can actually extract the optical properties of these uh, samples. And then go over some strategies of how do you manage the experimental conditions to really utilize this type of inverse solver approach to its fullest. And then wrap things up with some take home messages. And if there's some time permitting, also give some examples of how inverse adding doubling has been used here at BLI, just to put some context as to what cases um, this would be a useful way of actually measuring the optical properties of tissue. And then finish it up. So 
introduction. Um, again, just wanted to kind of give a refresher on concepts introduced from the first day of this workshop. You know, forward model, this is again, something that describes what happens to light in media as a function of the properties of that medium. So again, if you have tissues that have a absorption, scattering, anisotropy, index of refraction, those are all inputs. If you know what those are, you can then go through and generate outputs. So namely, you can then model what the radiance at the boundaries of, of tissues or the fluence within volumes of tissues, what that would be. So again, that describes what happens to light. In most of our cases, what we're more interested in is measuring light to get what are the actual optical properties. So again, that's this inverse model where it infers the properties of the tissue based on the measurable outputs of an unknown medium. So again, you know, this kind of tissue is a black box. You throw light into it, something comes out, you can make a measurement of it. What does it tell you about what happened inside? So in general, the measurable outputs are not sufficient to fully describe the inputs in these properties. So again, this is a concept anybody talking about inverse solvers or tomography or any of those types of complex solutions, you'll hear the term ill-posed over and over again. So you know the idea is that there's only so many different things that you can measure from tissue. However, the properties inside that will determine light transport are much greater in number. So again, how do you really isolate the effects of one aspect, like a scattering from absorption in tissue? How do you differentiate that from what the actual index of refraction is of tissue? So there's a lot of different properties going on, but there's a limited number of ways that you can independently measure the outputs. And so this becomes a big challenge. So however, there are ways to kind of work around this. And you, know, you can try to deal with this ill-posedness problem of inverse solvers by carefully selecting the forward model that you're using. So there's ways to simplify your model. Under limited special conditions, you can reduce the dimensionality of your problem and thereby have your measurable quantities match what the optical properties you're looking for in tissue. Um, you could also make assumptions on tissue properties and the distribution, so you can put constraints to your problem to limit the range of types of solutions you can get from these inverse solvers, constraints on your measurement geometry, or do different experimental conditions. So rather than you know, trying to measure exactly what everything is, actually vary your sample that you're measuring in a way to look at as a function of how the conditions of your sample change, what do your measurements make to try to reduce that answer to get the optical properties that you want. So from that point, inverse solutions are achievable. But again, the caveat is, is always in a certain context. And so this is what really becomes a big challenge in a lot of these biomedical uh, imaging approaches. If you want to be quantitative, you have to understand that it's quantitative to a certain extent or within a certain context and how you actually define what tissue is. You have to kind of make a definition of here's this black box. I'm going to say it's a homogeneous slab of optical properties where the distributions are even in between. And in, under those conditions, I can solve for it. But in reality, it may not be a homogeneous distribution. It may not be other things. So you know, the, always, the question is, is you can always measure something. You can always find some model, try to develop a method for an inverse solution, but the answers that you get out of that are always in the context of how you define the problem to begin with. So there are a variety of models and methods that have been developed to date. You know, each of these have their own strengths and weaknesses. So typically, a lot of the things that we'll be comparing between the, uh, these different types of models is computational burden versus accuracy. So you might have an inverse solver approach based on standard diffusion. That's an analytical form and an approximate form. So that could be very fast to compute. However, there's going to be limitations as to where those assumptions are, remain valid versus where they break down. It's an approximation. Whereas you can have something like Monte Carlo, 
where again, it's typically modeled as a gold standard for uh, radiative transport, but that can be very computationally intensive. So you can have accuracy, but it might take more time to um, process your data. There's also you know, contrast between the measurement complexity and acquisition time. So again, if you're trying to make more independent measurements, types of measurements, to reduce this ill-posedness problem of the, these inverse solvers, you have a much more complex instrument, and it'll take more time to make all these measurements on tissue. And you know, or as opposed to having a very simple approach where you can make very fast measurements and be able to kind of now not just look at what are the baseline optical properties of tissues, but the dynamics involved with it. There's sensitivity to spatial heterogeneity. So again, what are the volumes of tissues that you're integrating over when you're trying to make these measurements? Can you resolve objects deep within tissue? Or is it going to be something that's going to be blurred out? Or can you really refine something? And lastly, instrumentation costs. So again, you can have inverse solution methods, but they may involve measurements that can be very costly and expensive equipments in order to actually make the type of measurements that would fit these models. So just in general, key to really successful research is to understand when and or where each method will best address the problem you wish to attack. So again, there's a lot of different approaches out there. You have to really have, it's more important to really know exactly what it is you intend to measure, what it is you hope to um, extract from it, and understand, is this the most appropriate method and approach to really address what I actually want to um, try to quantify in terms of tissue? So that's just kind of a conceptual level recapture of kind of what are these kind of inverse solvers versus forward models in a very general sense. And now I just want to kind of go on and go specifically about this adding doubling approach. So kind of what is adding doubling? So as we, we saw from these previous lectures, you know, we can typically describe light in terms of radiance. So again, the six dimensional problems of space and angle. But adding doubling, the first thing it really does is it simplifies everything down to a one dimensional case. So what this really will go through and do is say, okay, now I'm going to look at just this slab geometry. I'm going to simplify over all angular directions, simplify over all spatial dimensions. So all we get is light is either going forwards or backwards in Z. That's it. And when we go through and try to do this very dramatic simplification, going from a six-dimensional quantity down to a one-dimensional quantity, what ends up happening is that you can reduce radiative transport and actually have a closed-form solution of radiance that is literally just this simple kind of first-order uh, differential type of solution of exponential terms where these lambda values are your mu transport types of parameters, and these are just co coefficients that would be dependent on your boundary conditions. So you can get this very, very simplified version of what will happen to light at the boundaries of these different slab tissues. So believe it or not, this is an exact solution of the radiative transport under the condition that you reduce it down to a one-dimensional space. So to kind of go in a little bit more detail, how did we get into all this? We can go back to our lovely radiative transport equation and just to start to reduce the dimensionality and see exactly step by step, how do we get down to the simplified um, first order differential solution? So the first thing is, is we are looking at steady state so we can eliminate all time dependence. So the one condition of inverse adding doubling is that it's constant in time. Your light source has no temporal component to it. The tissue that you're looking at, the optical properties do not change over time. So we can just eliminate that from all our parameters. So from that, now we get down to somewhat of a simpler equation. The next thing is, is we can reduce all the spatial components. So now, Instead of R's, we can replace them just with X or Z, the one single spatial dimension. And then also we get rid of all the angular dependencies in this equation. 
So that now really comes to this scattering term, this phase function term here, that we're going to just integrate over all angles and say our, our simplified solution is just over all angles, what exits the tissue on one side of the slab, what exits the tissue on the other side of the slab, and just compress that all down. Now you have this simple first order equation, or first order differential equation, in going in the positive x direction and the negative x direction, and that's where we get this simple exponential solution uh, for this partial differential equation. So, from all this, again, there are a couple different references here, and I think at the end, I'll summarize all the different references as well if you want to look at it into more detail. Um, we have now our first order differential equations where we can look at light radiance coming into tissue, what happens, what exits, what comes back out, and of course, if you have your source from the opposite side of the slab, you can also go through and model all that. And basically what you can get is that if you're looking at what light is transmitted through the tissue, so this radiance at boundary one and going in the positive direction, what you have, it's the sum of the radiance that comes into this lab from the opposite direction, plus any radiance that comes in from that same boundary from the opposite direction. And you have these coefficients that the R and T which are these reflectance and transmittance operators. So these now, what you were able to do is break down this whole problem to a bunch of sources, your radiance from other directions, and these operators that will basically be the, the transfer of from one boundary to the next based on the direction. Do you consider it an R or a T, a, re, a transmittance or a reflectance? So likewise, you would have to describe your reflectance, so if your source is coming in here, what comes back out is based on your reflectance operator acting on your source illumination coming in and any transmittance from any light source that is coming in this direction. So of course here, if we're just illuminating the slab from one point, we don't have anything here, so you can eliminate that so you get your transmittance and reflectance as a function of your source illumination right here. And these transmittance and reflectance operators are driven by the solutions of the radiative transport. So this is, again, the simple exponential solution that you get from reducing the dimensionality of your radiative transport. So what are the, some of the, the other appealing properties of this adding doubling approach? Is the fact that you, know, you can calculate your transmittance and reflectance of light from a, a thin homogeneous layer, but the doubling property is the fact that this is a function of the thickness of the slab. So if you can come up with a, a solution for one thickness, you can actually scale now that solution for any thickness of that given optical property. So that's the kind of doubling idea, is the fact that any solution at one point will now go through and you can just multiply that and scale that for any arbitrary thickness of that slab. The other aspect of this is that when you look at the adding is the fact that you can also come up with solutions where you actually have slabs of different optical properties and add them to each other. And so here you can have a slab of a certain type of optical property a slab of a certain type of optical property here and this, and you can go through and propagate from one slab to the next what those solutions are. So you can even vary slab to slab what those properties are. And again, getting to the inverse solver approach, this becomes somewhat relevant for if you wanted to make measurements of liquid samples. Typically, you will have to put them in a cuvette. So in order to go through and solve for the optical properties of your liquid sample, you have to input exactly what are the optical properties of your cuvette walls to run the inverse solver. So if you know what these optical properties are here, you can then solve for what's in the middle because you've already accounted for due to this adding property of, of this type of model. 
So how is this a powerful model? Again, this is an exact solution of radiative transport. So there is no restriction for the ratio of, uh, of scattering and absorption. This will, and essentially what that really means is that this will work for all wavelengths. And of course, the caveat there is this will work for any wavelength you want to solve for, so long as the only outputs you get are reflectance and transmittance. So one thing is, is if you wanted to measure optical properties in the ultraviolet, you always have to be concerned about generation of fluorescence. This does not account for fluorescence in this case. But if all you have is reflectance and transmittance, adding doubling can calculate it at any wavelength, at any thickness of the sample, so long as you can measure it. So it's a very open-ended type of approach, not like um, the kind of standard diffusion equation where you would have limitations on which wavelengths you can measure, namely because the first you know, assumption for standard diffusion is that you have to have scattering much higher than absorption. Once you get into the visible, that is violated, so you can't really use standard diffusion in the visible regime. You can also, you know, for different thicknesses of samples, again, limit limitations of standard diffusion is based on you have to have something that is essentially isotropic, you can't have distances that are very short um, within the reduced scattering regime because the accuracy will decline from there. With the adding doubling approach, you can go through and look at any range. So there's also no restrictions on scattering and isotropy. However, like radiative transport, you have to assume this kind of scattering phase function based on anisotropy. So again, you know, that's the one limitation. It's not going to be like an idealized me scatterer that you can base it off of, but you know, you have to assume some kind of phase function like Haney Greenstein uh, and go from there. But so long as you have a regime where all that matters that you can describe scattering as a function of the scattering coefficient and an anisotropy factor, there are no restrictions as to what value of scattering anisotropy you can have for your sample in this approach. The internal reflections at boundaries are included. So again, as from the, the earlier lecture, you know, you have your boundary uh, conditions described by Fresnel reflections. You know, this is a model that can account for that as well. So you can have index matches, mismatches between different layers and have a means to account for how would those internal reflections alter the, the light transport and the radiance at the boundaries themselves. So that's what makes rate, uh, adding doubling you know, very kind of useful and powerful. It's very flexible, can go over a wide range of optical properties, but you have to give something up in order to get that kind of an advantage. And so the one thing you give up is the fact that there is no time dependence. So this is all a steady state solution. The layers must be uniform. So again, you have to have assumptions on the properties of your samples. So the fact that it's, you know, you can't have something that is infinite in lateral extent. You have a finite sample. The model assumes that everything is infinite, an idealized case. So, and you have to have a finite thickness and the optical properties within that thickness has to be evenly distributed. So oftentimes with biological samples, that may not be the case. So you have to be careful and how you understand that. But that's the one constraint that you have to make on the samples and that, yeah. So here again, absorption and scattering must be evenly distributed within the volumes of these layers. Uniform, you know, illumination must, is, must be uniform, but it can be also, you know, either in terms of being collimated or diffuse light. You can model them in both ways, but the idea is that you have this idealized light source going through the sample, and you have to be careful because, again, this is now looking at thin slabs. The geometry of your light source and how it enters the tissue will also affect how it's scattered and the path length it will take within that finite distance. So adding doubling is a forward model that can, de can describe the outputs of reflectance and transmittance at the boundaries of tissue. So again, another caveat here is that this method is not optimized for describing fluence within volumes. 
it's designed to look at at the boundaries what do you get so in order to try to estimate what fluence would be you can go through and model very very thin layers and use the doubling method to kind of go through and scale that all through but that's not very efficient way of trying to solve for the problem but this is more to say at the boundaries what's happening to the light it's a simplified model simplified radiance into a one-dimensional function assuming lateral homogeneity that there's only one spatial dimension of interest and integrates over all scattering angles so from this model we can reduce our number of input parameters to only five so again doesn't seem that exciting but you know that's that's at least a start that's pretty good there's a lot of other things that you can have in terms of input parameters here we can go and it's like this is a forward model you have only five inputs you get two outputs so that's the whole ill posedness is the fact that you only can make two different types of measurements and five inputs so you can't solve for that absolutely but five's a good start so you can go through and actually reduce these these numbers of parameters by assuming or measuring the values of the index of refraction independently assuming a value or measuring independently what the anisotropy factor is making physical measurements of the thickness if you can go through and either measure or assume these three parameters you can then go through and reduce this problem to only have two input parameters so you're scattering and absorption so you have now two measurements two unknowns that you can go through and address this ill posedness of course it's not an absolute case just because you have to also consider all the experimental conditions sources of errors from there but under idealized circumstances you have two measurements two unknowns you have a posed well posed problem so just wanted to take a little bit of a break there before I start going into the inverse solver approach just to say you know if there are any questions regarding this uh, adding doubling approach um, if there's anything else I can help clarify on that um, please ask away probably just missed something but you were saying that one of the main computations is you integrate over all exit angles mm -hmm. but I thought light could only travel in one direction positive and negative right so the model itself is simplified by integrating over all angles as it exits so again it's only describing light at the boundaries so that's where the one simplification is and so when you say something exits in this lab in one direction or the other it can in reality exit over any angle but what we're going to do is say well anything that exits I don't care what the angle is I'm going to just count it as going in one direction are we talking about during the physical measurement because can't it only exit at one angle so so yeah from the model it's basically you're integrating over all angles so for the actual physical measurement and you know, I'll be getting that into a bit um, you know what we'll actually use are things called integrating spheres where again it literally will integrate over all the angles so you get a single measurement independent of whatever the exit angle might be so that's the one way that we kind of are able to measure something in the simplified one-dimensional case yeah. all right so on to our inverse model so as I said you know our forward model for adding doubling you have these five parameters that would describe how light would be either transmitted or reflected from a thin slab of tissue one strategy is also now we can try to reduce these parameters by using these dimensionless parameters so rather than looking at our absorption scattering and isotropy index and thickness you can look at these alpha and tau parameters where again these are scaled dimensionless parameters that you know you've been seeing in the previous lectures in terms of the graphs of what are the ratios between different things here 
we have our alpha, so our, our A parameters is albedo, and tau is our optical thickness. So again, rather than physical thickness, this is now this uh, dimensionless parameter where it's the function of both the physical thickness and the optical properties within that slab. So again, estimating what is the optical path length within the slab itself. So from our measurements, you know, we have a way of describing the reflectance that would lead to a radiance in one side of the slab and our transmittance, which will describe our radiance at the other side of the slab. We can also then go through and look at the index of refraction, where we can now say if we assume that index of refraction of air is 1, our index of refraction per sample is 1.4, we can manage what those boundary conditions and internal reflections would be, assume that we have a Haney-Greenstein scattering function that would be described uh, by the anisotropy factor. You know, what we can go through is just have a goal to say, now, rather than saying, I have a forward model, this is what reflectance I would get out of this thin sample, or this is what the transmittance I would get out of the, the thin sample. What we want to do is look for an inverse solution to say, if we can measure our reflectance and transmittance, what is the absorption of that sample, or what is the scattering of that sample? And so this inverse solution involves an iterative, iterative uh, strategy. So again, iterations, it involves uh, just starting off with a guess of what our optical properties are. You can then go through, based on our guess, calculate what the reflectance and transmittance should be for our sample, compare those calculated values to measured values, and come up with some metric to test the goodness of fit, and iterate until you minimize that metric. So I don't know if this is something that had been already introduced, or is it going to be later in lectures about the kind of minimization methods and all that. So I'm not going to spend any more time on that, but just to kind of give you an idea of, you know, typically in its simplest form, an inverse solver is not necessarily a direct solution, an analytic solution of an equation, but saying, okay, here's this forward direction. Now we're just going to guess and see how well our model matches our experiment and minimize it until we can get agreement between the two. So this is where oftentimes a lot of things can be very computationally intensive because it's just a guessing iterative approach, but it also depends on how well and how quickly you can run the forward model to get to your, and have it converge to a solution. So in terms of inverse adding doubling, you know, we can go through and actually look at, well, what is our parameter space in terms of our measurement and our ultimate optical properties that we're, we're looking for. So again, an example here is that if we measure our total transmission, total reflectance for any given slab and any given thickness, you're going to get a, val a single value here and a single value here. It will lay somewhere on this graph and our inverse model will go through, you can overlay a mesh of saying, okay, based on the relationship of optical properties, where would you find, you know, in terms of albedo here and scattering anisotropy here? If you have a value that lies at this point here, you can go through and converge to a single solution. So while this mesh demonstrates that there is a unique solution for these inverse solvers, that there is no overlap, there are certain regions where the mesh begins to collapse. And so again, any time that you have very, very small changes in either reflectance or transmittance can result in large changes in what the actual optical properties are. There is a problem of being able to converge to a unique solution there. Even though a unique solution exists, you have to consider noise, other issues that can actually cause smite changes and errors in your ability to measure the reflectance and transmittance could result in large differences in what the resulting optical properties are. So that's one thing to always keep in mind is that a unique solution exists. You can go through and solve for it. It can give you a number. But how do you know that number is correct? 
So one strategy is you can also use similarity theory to actually go through and try to re-parameterize these problems. So approaches to go from your albedo to this A prime and tau to tau prime. And by doing this, you have now a new mesh where you have this reduced representation of the inverse solution that is now a little bit more e evenly distributed in terms of your total transmission and total reflectance. And so now, if you're trying to solve for these reduced parameters, you can actually get a much more robust solution because your spacing and definition between differences of one parameter and the other are farther apart. But yeah, I think that was all I really wanted to say. So getting into now, we have a mesh, we have a unique solution that is a direct correlation between what you can measure in terms of reflectance and transmittance and be able to get a unique pair of absorption and scattering. The one question, and again, going to the question that we had earlier is, well, then how do we measure total reflectance and transmittance? So again, we live in a physical world. Radiance is typically described in six different dimensions. We have now gone through and developed a solution under extremely simplified conditions to say we're going to reduce six dimensions down to one. How do we measure that? And so, you know, the one thing is, is, yeah, the question is like, well, how do we capture and detect overall angles in a physical measurement? And that's where we come up with this integrating sphere, just to go through some of the instrumentation. So this type of setup to do inverse adding doubling, you have three different primary components. You need to have a light source. Again, a CW, steady state light source, um, a means of collimating it, because again, the conditions for the model to say your source has to be collimated or diffusely, like planar illumination over the entire source. And then you have to have a means of detecting over all angles. So that's where these integrating spheres come from, and essentially an integrating sphere is just a sphere coated with spectralon or something that's highly reflective in scattering. So again, a very white porous material on the inside. And the, the concept behind this is the fact that as your light travels through the physical sample, anything that's transmitted through, you're going to have absorption and scattering happen within the sample here that you're exiting light can be over any angle. So how do you sum all that up? The idea is that you can have now light exiting at every angle, but since the sphere is highly reflective and scattering, it will just kind of integrate and sum up over all those angles. And then you'll have a single detector at one end that samples the total transmitted light from that whole sphere as all these photons now ideally just bounce around inside. Similarly, for the reflectance, again, you have your sample on the back end. You send your collimated beam straight through. Again, anything that's reflected can come over at any angle, but the idea of the sphere is that it will collect all the photons reflected, diffusely reflected from the sample within the sphere, let it bounce around, and then you make a measurement and sample the intensity of that. And in this case here is the fact that if, if you have specular reflection, so again, these kind of Fresnel reflections at the surface, is the fact that anything that is directly reflected off the surface and doesn't integrate with your sample will go and directly exit your sphere and not be um, integrated with that whole sample. So again, one way of managing um, the fact that these integrating spheres will only measure the diffuse reflectance and diffuse transmittance of light, not anything at the surface itself. So yeah, so again, going into a little bit more details, the, the actual construction of these spheres is the fact that the interiors are coated with a highly scattering reflective material. So again, this can be spectralon, this can be magnesium oxides, other oxide powders, um, et cetera, and that the goal of this sphere is the fact that you have this physical object that will physically integrate your optical signals over a four pi solid angle. 
and that you have a detector port that samples a fraction of this diffusely scattered light. And yeah, again, the configuration here for the transmittance is that you would place your sample at the front of the sphere, send light through it. Anything that comes out at your second boundary will be integrated and collected by the sphere, measured by the detector. And then for the reflectance is the fact that you have the light going all the way through the sphere. Anything that will come back from this direction will be integrated by the sphere and detected here. So that is, again, in principle, all you really need to do to make measurements of your reflectance and transmittance. We know from our inverse adding doubling model that that's all you need. You can get your absorption and scattering. You're done. But what we have to do is let reality set in for a moment. Because again, that's under idealized conditions. And we have to recognize the fact that integrating spheres are not perfect integrators. So that's the one thing that, you know, again, if it was perfect and light can be bounced around in every angle and we can measure every single photon, wonderful. That's not what happens in, in reality. We also have to keep in mind that reflectance and transmittance are relative measurements. Again, it's always the essentially the percentage of light relative to how much light you send into the sample. And physical measurements contain noise. You can have bias in your detectors. So there are other sources where you can get errors in your measurements itself. And your physical samples are finite. So again, inverse adding doubling by simplifying everything down to one dimension. It assumes that if your one dimension is z, it assumes that your samples x and y directions are infinite. What happens if you have just a, a sample that's one millimeter wide? Well, of course, you know, now you really aren't looking at those conditions. That's one thing you have to be um, very careful about. So you have to understand that, okay, this is not this simplified. We aren't actually creating a measurement system that is existing only in one dimension. It still exists in all the, the six dimensions, the, the three spatial, three angular, but we're trying to make a measurement that will integrate over all those. And we have to understand exactly at what point does that begin to break down? At what point do we still need to consider what else might be happening? So again, looking at uh, instrumentation, integrators, integrating spheres are not perfect. The walls of this interior of the spheres are not 100% reflective. Good ones can be 99 to 98% reflective. Bad ones can be much worse. And so that means that every single time that you're having light bounce off the interior wall when it's scattering it at multiple angles, you can have losses going through every single time. And when you're integrating, this is a steady state, you don't know when you're detecting the photon, how many times has it interacted with the sphere itself. You also have to keep in mind that not all angles are integrated. This is not a f perfect four pi. You have physical ports where light goes through. So there are certain solid angles of the sphere where you do not have the integration of your sample. So again, angles subten subtended by your sample, by the entrance port, detector ports are places that are lost. But the nice thing is, is that thankfully, somebody has figured out all these details for you. So again, um, in one of the references that I've included in this paper, somebody has gone through and actually looked at the cases where if it's not perfectly reflective, what are the secondary effects to say, how do we go through and correct for the imperfect reflectivity of the walls over multiple reflections? Also, if we look at the relative sizes of our ports, so our sample port, where we send the light in, our detector port, and say, if we remove those from the solid four pi angles, how does that affect our measurement and light losses? And also, if we look at just as a function of intensity, you can actually calibrate your spheres and correct it to an idealized case. So this is where calibration comes into play. And it's very tedious, but the nice part is, is people have already done this. It's the nice thing about having a very established method. Everyone else has done the hard work for you. You can just come in and just use that. So in terms of calibration, again, we're looking at reflectance and transmittance as relative quantities. 
dependent on our source illumination. So in order to measure our reflectance and transmittance of a sample, we also need to characterize our source and account for any other signals that we may measure, such as stray light into our system, detector dark current, so on and so forth. So typically what we'll do for these uh, types of systems is that we'll make a measurement of just the integrating sphere itself under idealized conditions, this would represent what 100% transmittance of light would be. And we can then use that as a reference to scale our sample reflectance and transmittance. But we could also measure our um, source as well with it blocked. So with no photons going through, this would characterize any dark current from our detector. This would characterize any stray light that might be entering our system that might be detected that has nothing to do with our sample or our source illumination. And so that would represent what our 0% transmittance or reflectance would look like. So making these two different measurements, we can establish the kind of general performance of our sphere and have a means to now go through and determine what is reflectance and transmittance relative to the source illumination and the performance of our system itself, the baseline performance. So from going there, you know, the other nice thing, again, since this is an established protocol, somebody has even written code to actually run the inverse solver for you. So again, there's code freely available on the web. Um, this is something that has been a, a long standing project from Scott Prawl at uh, Oregon Me Medical Laser Center. Well, actually, I don't even know where he is now. Oh, okay. So, but, um, you know, the nice thing about this software package, and again, it's freely da downloadable from this website, is the fact that it has a means to run the inverse adding doubling code for you. So all you need to do is just input what your reflectance and transmittance values are, but it will also carefully consider all the different experimental conditions of your sphere, how large of a sphere it is, how large are your ports, what is the reflectivity of your sphere, what are the thickness of your samples, and try to actually anticipate all the physical limitations of your measurement and account for that in the code itself. So again, this takes into account your sphere properties. It takes into account the sample geometry and specular reflection. So again, what is the index of refraction of your sample? Is it in a cuvette versus air or just a bare sample itself? And how would that be accounted for? And the biggest thing is it accounts for the side light losses. So this is, again, the one thing to consider is that when you're dealing with physical samples and physical dimensions of your sphere, you have the opportunity is that the inverse adding doubling method, as a consequence of simplifying everything down to a one-dimensional problem, it has no means to account for any light that might be interacting with the sample, but won't exit in either the forward or backward direction. In reality, if you have a physical thickness to your sample, you can actually have photons that will scatter around and exit the sides of your sample. And so what this code will actually do is the fact that it will run an ad adding doubling model, converge to an answer, and then say, ask the question, given the physical thickness of the sample, given the, the physical parameters of the sphere itself, if these were the optical properties of the sample, how many photons would never enter the sphere? And then say, okay, if that's the correct, you know, this is how many, then let's reiterate the adding doubling to account for the fact that when you're actually measuring your transmittance here, you're losing these photons on these sides here that will never get captured. And so it will try to account for it and say, okay, now correcting for those losses that you get from the side, what are the actual optical properties? And so that becomes another way of really considering the physical properties and the limitations of the simplified solution down to one dimension, but applying it to actual um, physical measurements in the real world. 
So some other strategies is considering uh, what are the properties of your sample itself. Again, this is also dependent on how much you are able to actually control the sample preparation. So one thing to bear in mind is inverse adding doubling does not account for surface roughness. In fact, it's explicitly not accounting for it. So again, the consequence of you know, simplifying everything down to a one-dimensional problem, there are no physical properties at the surface. It's merely a Fresnel reflection between different index of refractions. So in order to run inverse adding doubling in a real physical case, it assumes that every single boundary is smooth and that the interaction of light at the boundary is only dependent on the uh, specular reflection and Fresnel reflections at those surface. So if you have a sample and there is roughness on that surface, it will not be able to produce accurate optical properties. Tissue heterogeneity, again, being in one dimension, it assumes that Every sample, no matter what physical location in X and Y, it's going to be the same, that you can actually reduce that and integrate it to a single value. So if there's heterogeneity in the sample, that's going to be an issue with the accuracy of the optical properties. And then also thickness variance. So again, it assumes in, sim in single dimension that you have a, a single thickness. Now, oftentimes when you actually have an actual physical sample, Certain areas might be a little thinner than others. You have to make sure that you're accounting for that thickness because as we know from the doubling property of inverse heading doubling, your values of optical properties will scale directly with the thickness. So if you're using an incorrect thickness, you'll get an incorrect values for um, the scattering and absorption. So important take home messages from all this is the fact that you know, what you really need to do is understand what are the practical constraints and limitations of the model and best exploit the advantages that approach has to offer. So if your samples and what you want to measure do not meet or approximate the constraints necessary in order to do inverse adding doubling, it'll be very challenging to use that, that and you basically eliminate all the advantages it has to offer. So rule number one, so I have basically three general rules in terms of using inverse adding doubling. And the first one is to minimize your sample nine idealities. So again, you, know, you want to have something that's perfectly homogeneous, perfectly flat, um, and perfectly smooth at the surface. Um, but you know, there's also these considerations to, to what about side light losses. So again, thinner samples, the thinner you can make the samples, you can minimize any side light loss because there'll be less and less opportunities for photons to exit the size of the sphere. But you want to keep in mind that the optical thickness, you want to span the space of reflectance and transmittance values, ideally keeping uh, a optical thickness of 0.75 to 12 as a safe range. Because again, when we showed um, that original plot in terms of reflectance and transmittance, that there were certain regions, if you have really low reflectance, really low transmittance, is that that kind of overlay mesh really tends to collapse. So you know there are certain guidelines to say, in order to make a really robust measurement, what the optical thickness should be. And so if you have some idea of what absorption scattering you should uh, anticipate, you can kind of get an idea of what would be the ideal range of thicknesses of your sample you should measure. And then the precision at which you can measure your, your sample oh, thickness is also important. So again, if it's really thin, hundreds of microns, you better be able to measure it within tens of microns to get within a 10% error. So again, that also becomes another thing is, is you know, what is your ability to accurately measure that because thickness will directly scale with your error. And in terms of sample preparation, um, you know, you want to make sure that this mimics an idealized slab of infinite lateral extent. So again, 
prepare the sample to have no surface roughness, even thickness, and minimize any spatial heterogeneities in and adjacent to the illumination area. So again, if you have the ability to have a very small collimated beam, you can go through and say, okay, I, I can just locate an area of this slab that looks homogeneous, make a measurement there and look at different regions, that's fine, but it becomes a ratio of, well, how homogeneous is it versus how much of an area are you actually illuminating? So rule number two looks at the instrument stability and configurability. So one key idea to keep in mind is that these types of integrating sphere systems are very lossy. So the signal you detect in the end is only a small fraction of the total reflectance or transmittance. So in order to do these types of measurements, you are required to have a sensitive and stable detector or integrate over a long time and have a lot of patience. Single spheres are easy to calibrate, but collimating a light, especially if you're going to be looking at spectral properties, so over multiple wavelengths, is something that's a little bit of a challenge because, again, now with a single sphere, you're making your measurements at two different spatial locations within the beam. And so you have to make sure that the spot size at one location is exactly matched with the spot size at another location. Usually, if you want to do it at a single wavelength, a laser is fine. That's where most of these systems have been originally developed. But then all you get is the absorption and scattering at a single wavelength. If you wanted to look at the spectral properties, collimating broadband illumination becomes much more challenging because lenses, you're going to have variations in index of refraction at different wavelengths. It's very challenging to collimate a beam. Uh, the lab system that we will be looking at uh, this afternoon, what we've actually done is actually used mirrors to collimate the beams, and that way we can actually do broadband. But collimating uh, broadband illumination with an off-axis mirror is very, very painful. So you know, there are certain challenges with that. Um, and then also using a variable iris is a convenient means to uh, adjust the amount of light used in the measurement. So again, if you have this issue and concern about heterogeneity in your tissue sample, if you have a collimated beam and an iris, you can go through and stop down the, the diameter of the beam to measure a small area. But if it's really homogeneous, you can open it up, send a lot more photons through to get a faster or a better signal in your measurement for the other one. So again, just having that ability to kind of configure systems one way or another to try to optimize your signal strength versus spatial constraints um, is somewhat useful. And the third rule is having an expectation of what optical properties you, you hope to measure. So again, what we've talked about is sample preparation um, you know, is going to be based on what the actual resulting optical properties are. So if you can go through and have some idea of this is the range of, of optical properties I expect to be measuring, you can go through and independently validate your results with known references or tissue simulating phantoms. So you can actually characterize your system and know in advance, here's at least five different gold standards, and this is the accuracy I can measure these with this system. And then you can put your unknown system or unknown sample in there and have an independent verification as to how accurate you would believe the uh, measured results of the unknown sample. So again, you know, for this, short path length cuvettes can be used to measure controlled concentrations of dyes and interlipids uh, for scattering or microspheres for scattering. So you can actually have an internal calibration there. Silicone phantoms can be fabricated in thin sheets and remain stable over time. So you'd always have a way of just independently characterizing the performance of your system. And also check the parameter space of your reflectance and transmittance to see where they fall. And again, this goes back to you know, the issue of if you have something that's um, weakly reflecting but very weakly uh, transmitting, that you have this collapse of your parameter space right here that any small error can result in a large change in the optical properties. Represented another way here is the fact that you have an example of a broadband spectrum of a tissue sample measured at two different thicknesses. 
And what you can see is there's a certain advantage of going with one thickness over another, that you have less opportunity of crosstalk, you have a less collapse of the dimensionality of your reflectance and transmittance spectra at one thickness versus another. So that's also just from a practical standpoint, if you can vary the thickness of your sample, you can actually tune it to ensure that you're going to get robust results. So here again are a list of all the different references. So in terms of instrumentation, are there any questions or any uh, thing that wasn't too clear when I went through? Two over there. Um, you didn't really discuss how collimated the light beam had to be and whether that really influences the measurements in any way. Can you comment on that? Yeah, so um, you know, the collimation of the light beam in terms of if you just have a single sphere, you know, it becomes very critical for the fact that you're making measurements at two different locations. And so depending on the area, of illumination. If that area changes, it's going to interact with a different volume of that slab. And so you'll actually get a different amount of reflectance because it's going to be interacting with either more or less absorbers, more or less scatterers. And so that's one consideration. So using a dual sphere, you're making, you're putting your sample at a single location. You have one sphere that would then collect the light for the reflectance, one for the transmittance. And so there, again, at least the area of illumination is going to be the same for the two different measurements. If it's not perfectly collimated, the angle might be different. So then if you have you know, a beam coming into a focus, photons entering from the side before it becomes completely diffuse, will travel a different path length relative to the physical thickness. And so there you can get some errors just due to the fact that you have photons entering at different angles that will cause different path lengths. But again, it becomes more of a practical concern of, you know, how do you minimize that and what is the impact of that? And that's going to be dependent on the thickness of your sample, the optical properties of the sample. So that's kind of the hard part. And that's where I was stressing, you know, having independent measures where you know what the optical properties are, these different phantoms, just to calibrate your system and be able to get a measure of, okay, how bad or how much does this imperfection in the collimation uh, really affect the, the outputs that you intend to measure. Uh, can you comment on um, taking these measurements ex vivo versus in vivo? I mean, I would assume as you take a sample ex vivo that it starts changing its properties, right. like water starts coming out of it. Um, yeah, yes. Has, has there been any correlation between the two or thoughts on that? So, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's exceptionally difficult to do in vivo measurements just because you need to have very thin samples. So there's very few places that you can keep an in vivo. I mean, I think, you know, there might be opportunities with, with mouse ear or something like that, because, but that becomes very challenging of just positioning that. So the majority have been either ex vivo tissue. And yeah, the caveats that are, are you're looking at excised tissues, there are going to be some changes, degradation. So it's not a direct correlation to what's going to be happening in vivo. Um, the other part is also just characterizing and quantifying tissue simulating phantoms to actually say, okay, now here's independent um, constructs that are stable over time with known optical properties that can mimic the properties of tissue. And then you would have independent measures of that. So those have been the kind of two different directions to actually go through. And there's been some studies to say, actually look at ex vivo samples over time to actually see what are those changes over time and what influence that might be. But that is a limitation of this approach. So my question is on uh, uniqueness of the inverse problem. Okay. So uh, the mesh you were showing over there uh, is in terms of transmission transmittance, reflectance, and the parameter A. Mm -hmm. So can you uh, explain us how you are going back from A to mu A and mu S prime? Because the okay. A might be unique, but mu A and mu S prime yeah. might not be unique. So so in, in this case, it's it's looking at, yeah, you have your, your albedo. So again, it's the ratio of, um, I always forget what one's on mu S over the sum of mu A and uh, mu S. 
so again, that's just the kind of dimensionless parameter that we are always looking at. Um, but the other parameter is the G. So again, that's in terms of the reduced scattering there. So, so yeah, I mean, you can kind of decouple that in terms of unique pairs of absorption and scattering. So again, the idea is that you actually have these two different measurements of total transmittance and total reflectance. And what we've done from the earlier uh, parameters is say, if you can assume a G, if you can assume index of refraction and measure your thickness, you will have a solution that is dependent on absorption and scattering and uh, by your measurements of transmittance and reflectance. And unfortunately, I wasn't able to have the time to actually generate something that would actually have in terms of pairs of mu a and mu s for that, but yeah. So to be clear about that, you're saying that by proving that um, albedo and I forgot the other parameter. Uh, it was anisotropy. Okay, and, and, and I saw, you, you're, you're saying that by proving that those are unique, that that proves that US and UA are unique, even though that A and G depend on both of those? Yeah, it's, I, I'm waving my hands right now just because okay. I, I grabbed this from literature. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, it, it, it's something where, you know, I just didn't have the time to actually generate my own figure of okay, sure. going through and doing this. So I don't know if Boston wanted to comment any more about the uniqueness. Well, I think the, the plot that's relevant here is, is the plot on the right. So, you know, um, Rolf mentioned that, you know, you do have to make an assumption with respect to refractive index and anisotropy. And once you do that, any pair of reflection and transmission gives you your optical thickness and your reduced albedo. And your optical thickness and reduced albedo are both functions of uh, your physical thickness, which you can measure, right. and your mu a and mu s prime. So basically, right. you have two equations and two unknowns, and you can extract mu a and mu s prime identically. And in the lab today, mm -hmm. I believe, you're going to have plots that actually show sensitivity to the right. of the recovered optical properties based on your assumptions mm -hmm. of, say, what G is and what um, your thickness is. So that'll give you a sense of what your experimental error is. And you'll find, in one case, that actually you have a thick sample, mm -hmm. and you'll say that you'll, your recovered properties will be insensitive to G. Right. And then there'll be another one which is either thinner or more highly absorbing, and actually your assumption of G will have a profound impact on the recovered optical properties. So yeah. does that kind of yeah. answer your question? Okay. Um, the other thing, since I do have a microphone, yeah. um, I believe that there have been studies where they try to measure the collimated transmission. Mm -hmm. And in doing, I guess, instead of using an integrating, well, you use integrating sphere, but mm -hmm. in the direct direction uh, through the sphere, on the other side, they have a really, really small port, and right. they let light leak out. And from that, they can uh, perhaps independently determine G. Um, yeah, yeah. So there, there, yeah, there have been some approaches where you can try to now go through and say, okay, you have your diffuse reflectance that inter you know that interacted with your sample, your diffuse transmittance. But then if you know relative to those how much light just went straight through and was undeviated from its path, you could then go through and try to infer, OK, relative to the light that was transmitted and had no deviation versus that light that was transmitted and had some deviated angle, you can infer what is the G value. So again, the relative ratios of that would determine, OK, how much does light actually deflect? And it, yeah, it's, it's a crude measurement, but yeah, it seems to be quite effective to try to do that. So there are things, and I believe even the, the code from uh, Scott Prawl has a way of setting it up where you can actually incorporate that measurement as well. So it's a very configurable code where it will work for a single sphere configuration, a dual sphere configuration. It will work with just diffuse reflectance and transmittance measurements. It can also have the collimated, transmitted data as well, and try to calculate all those different parameters. So, Rolf, um, 
quick question. So clearly you're doing these measurements over a wavelength band, mm -hmm. right? So, um, so in reality, um, that implicitly means that the sample will have a different optical thickness at each wavelength. Yep. So um, any words to the wise as far as how you choose um, a physical thickness of sample to try. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I think, you know, especially if you're doing over like very broad wavelength regions, you know, the same issue that I brought up with why you can't use lenses to collimate both visible and near infrared light is very tricky to do. Same thing is true for your sample is the fact that the index of refraction of your sample can vary as a function of wavelength. And so, um, right now, like a lot of the stuff that we've been doing here is to actually look at what are the relative differences. And so that will be a part of the, the simulated portion of the, the afternoon lab was changing your index of refraction. How much does that really affect your resulting optical properties? And, you know, just account for that to say that there's going to be some variance. There's going to be some amount of error related to that. Similarly, over different wavelengths, the value of G can also change. Because again, you know, if you think back to the Mi scatterers, it's relative to the size of, of the wavelength versus the size of the particle. You're going through different uh, wavelengths. You're going to have slightly shifts, different shifts in that. Um, so that becomes another potential source of error, just trying to go over a very broad wavelength regime. Um, but again, it becomes a question of being able to kind of model this, understand what your sensitivity is to the, each parameter, and it's going to be dependent on the input parameters, so your optical properties, your thickness, will also affect how robust your results will be. But you know, I mean, that's just something you need to take into account for. So. Let's see how do I put this? Um, it seems like uh, there's you know you're, there's a lot of work into studying where the errors can up in these measurements and mm -hmm. how good the measurements are. Um, can you comment on when you, you try to like prepare a tissue and it could come from very different uh, people or animals or wherever it comes from, that I assume has a lot of variation in there. Right. And I, I got, I don't know, it feels to me like that variation can be huge compared to the variation in these measurements, but I don't know if that's correct. Can you, can you sort of comment on yeah, I mean, it, it really depends on the type of tissue and whether it's appropriate for these types of measurements or not. So again, you know, the level, the degree of heterogeneity, um, you know, again, if you have certain samples, you might not have perfect control over the thickness of each sample, but if you can measure it, that becomes more critical to say, I can at least measure what this is. And then, you know, in terms of heterogeneity, it's, well, do I integrate over a larger spot size and just average that heterogeneity out? Or do I try to go over a smaller spot size to go through and look at isolated regions and try to make measurements there? So it really depends on what do you need this for? What do you hope to determine? And you know, can you address the imperfections in a way that will make sense for that? So I think your issue is a slightly different one, not huh? spatial heterogeneities within a given sample, but um, differences in optical properties from, say, subject to subject. Yeah. Is that right. Yes. Yeah. So, Take it back from one subject to another subject. Are mm. we going to see bigger variations, or they're going to be all relatively the same? I mean, is there agreement among people who do these measurements on some type of tissue type that hey, they're all generally the same, and they're all getting the same, or can they widely vary? Um, I mean, yeah, they can widely vary. I mean, that's that's one of the approaches. One of the classic examples of where this approach was used originally was from excised skin tissue to actually try to quantify the um, concentration of pigmentation and the amount of melanin in different tissue types. And so there, the optical properties varied wildly. But again, since fundamentally the idealized model is independent on you know, what range of optical properties, what wavelengths you can use, you know, it was a nice robust platform to be able to at least try to take a stab at these really wildly ranging uh, optical properties from one tissue to the other. The practical concerns is now try, how do you optimize an actual measurement system in order to maintain 
you know, an equal accuracy across that really broad range of optical properties. So it is true that, you know, clearly skin is probably the tissue that probably changes the most from subject to subject, as we're pretty familiar with just looking around the room, you can kind of infer, and not only with our pigment, but also with age, there are a lot of changes. And that's true uh, with all tissues to a certain degree. But I think it's remarkably, it's remarkable that in healthy subjects um, of in tissues that typically don't undergo dramatic degeneration with time. So if you look at the lung, for instance, in a non-smoker, and you look over a population that's healthy, there's not as much variation, say, in lung tissue as there is for the same population in their skin tissue, you know, or healthy breast tissue for, say, premenopausal women, you know, or, but, you know, there changes if, you know, of course, if they have pathologies or, or, or if there are certain natural physiological changes that happen as one ages. So nonetheless, I, I think the differences in optical properties between different tissue types um, is still very instructive to do. And I think, I think in my first lecture, I gave, you know, there, I gave you a reference which kind of look, you know, gives you some notion of, of um, of where you fall for a given tissue type, whether it is highly scattering or not relative to absorption, or what are the spectral uh, signatures of that tissue type relative to other tissues. So I think that in and of itself informs you. And then as you will learn, you know, this is the very first methodology that they had that was developed to, to get optical properties. Obviously it's excites the tissue, which is an attractive for a number of things, but you know, tomorrow and the day after you're gonna see how you properties non invasively and so that's very very powerful and then you can really get at patient patient variation and then look at impacts of physiological changes on these properties does that help at all or give some context yeah yeah i'm just going to skip over the other examples but there, at least on the slides of all that stuff, but yeah. Okay.